Okay. It's all his fault. Like together. Uh, so my name's Khan, and I'm here with Abs. We both work at uh, Deluxe. I guess the, the first question would be, how many people here think that we're going to be talking about a CDN network today? <laughs> Probably some of you, right? Yeah, one over there. <laughs> Um, so we're actually going to be talking about what it takes to move things like episodic and feature films from source all the way to distribution sync. Um, so this is basically a lot of what uh, Deluxe does. So it's pretty hard to try and you know uh, formalize this uh, and actually describe the whole process like end to end. Um, so we thought we'd split it in two. Um, uh, you might find the first half interesting because. You sort of have to understand like the, the patterns that are used, um, the way that we have to drive the architecture from the business perspective. Because um, a lot of these things, if you look at it just from like the face value of we're in a single region in AWS, for example, that sounds like an anti-pattern, right? But for our use case, it's the only way to make it work cost effectively. Um, so that there are those kind of design decisions that we've had to make for this. Um, so the whole group of us here work on a platform called Deluxe One. Um, and Deluxe has been in business for like 103 years. It started as a, um, a film processing lab in LA, connected to Fox, and then spun off from there. Um, but basically, everything that Deluxe does as a company is from creation all the way through to delivery of content. So, we're on the technical team, if you will. There's a creative division, there's a technologies division, and then there is a distribution division as well. Um, so we basically work on a platform called One. Um, and if you think about things like film processing or film distribution, um, if you're distributing to like theaters and whatnot, traditionally that's all been things like hand carrying drives because they have to be encrypted, right, to protect the movies that are going for distribution. Um, a lot of like LTO tape libraries, et cetera. Um, so it's a very physical process. And that whole supply chain that we work on, a digital supply chain for aggregating um, episodic and feature films and then distributing that, um, the whole thing around that has been very like hands-on, lots of CSRs, lots of people involved, right? So our whole thing is to try and automate everything that we can there to make this thing fully automatable end to end, uh, which is not an easy task. Um, so you know, if you look at the, the basic parts of the business for Deluxe, um, there's mastering, and that's where you basically, um, you're finishing a film right before you actually uh, put the master somewhere, store it, and then create what we call like a heavy asset or a mezzanine file. And just like a mezzanine file, that file sits between the master film asset that the studio holds and then the distribution assets that are pushed out to like your Netflix or your iTunes or your Hulu or your theaters or whatever. Um, and these assets are pretty big. Like this is our, probably our biggest problem is dealing with the weight of these assets, right? They can go up to um, multiple gigabytes in size, um, close to terabytes, right? Um, so if we look at, like, where do we start, right? The asset drives the supply chain that we have to build the infrastructure around. Um, and just a single file, so, you know, the, uh, if you look at, a, say, a feature film, for example, uh, one of these files, like a heavy asset, can be 500 gigabytes. And if you look at, like, 4K and 8K, that goes up to 800 gigabytes and upwards of there. Um, and that's for one asset. So then we also have to have other things with that. So imagine if this content has to get distributed in, say, the Czech Republic. We have to localize the language. We need subtitles. Um, we need what we, we call materials analysis. In other words, we have to analyze the file, figure out the codecs in it, the video properties, et cetera, the metadata that goes with it that describes it, like the movie genre, et cetera, because those things are important for like your iTunes or your Hulu or whatever to, to drive their search engines, right? So it all comes from that source for distribution. Um, so that's why you see for like the assets per title, that explodes out, right? And these could be smaller files, but there are a lot of them. So, you know, if, if you try to optimize infrastructure to process very large files, the outlier is now we have hundreds of thousands of very small files. So that affects like what you select for storage, right? Um, so everything that we do right now, we have to be object store native. 
because it's just too time consuming to do things like hydrate content to EBS volumes and or move it around. Um, and then the outputs, this is where it gets even worse, right? So if you look at things like if you wanted to do output to say a PlayStation 3 or PlayStation 4, you need pr probably tens of thousands of files, small chunked files that get distributed out. Um, so the asset where we start with is like challenge in and of itself. Um, and then the existing business for what's happening now, so our, our platform is absorbing a lot of these things and automating these workflows. Um, but we have to de deal with these existing use cases, right? So the existing business delivers about 4.5 to 5 petabytes of content per month out for distribution, um, which is a constant velocity, right? So this affects everything from can we use direct connects? How many direct connects do we, do we use? Can we use UDP acceleration? All of these things that key into the input and the output side of the platform we build are extremely important. Um, and then you can see just the volume and the scale, right? So four and a half thousand digital assets, and these could be these large files, or they could be those groupings of like say 10,000 files. Um, and just the other end of that spectrum, like that was a distribution piece and the source piece, right? But then if you look at the, what, what metrics drive the platform, there are actually a, a whole bunch here, right? I, I won't get into all of them, but think of, just the one figure there for seven million minutes process per month. So that means ingest the content, transcode it, conform it, checksum it, maybe run uh, machine learning analysis against that as well, um, archive it, encrypt it, and then distribute it. So it's a lot of processes, and you can probably see from this type of structure that's very fungible, something like a monolithic application or even like auto scaling just on instances with code deployed there, it doesn't work. So the only, the only approach that works for this is truly microservice type platform, right? Horizontally scaled. Um, and then if I look at some of these figures specifically, right? So you can see here, our challenge is the current business, 30,000 assets get ingested a month. So we have to scale that and get that into object store. The total volume, 600 petabytes, that could be on-prem, it can also be in cloud. So there's a problem of like, where do you attach the compute to, right? Um, how do you distribute your processes? Um, and then we have to meet this SLA of 99.99%. But the thing to bear in mind here is that the expectation from a recipient of content is not to have it delivered in a few minutes. So these SLA time windows are typically eight hours. So the cool thing there is that gives us the ability to say orchestrate restores from Glacier in batch at the cheapest tier, right? Because we can still meet SLA and we're still beating on-prem time. Um, but I think most importantly, if you look at all of these, the real thing that drives the platform um, is any amount of compute that we consume on say an AWS or anywhere else is irrelevant because all of our costs goes into storage and egress data costs of moving the content around. Um, so just on the left here, before I hand it over to Abs, um, the left, you, you see all of these processes lined out, right? And really what we're doing for processing a piece of content um, is it's basically a DAG from top to bottom, right? So ingest, transform, localize, all of these are separate microservices orchestrated together. Um, they pass the content or they pass references to the content from one container to another, go through the whole process and then distribute it and then close it out with the SLA met or not met or whatever that might be. Um, but if you look at the, you know, looking at these points that I discussed before, um, and I, I didn't get into some of the other things like Handsmaid's Tale, um, that, that's an interesting one. Um, but you know, if we get time for Q&A afterwards, we can describe you know, how that works from the film perspective and how those files come together and what drives it from the creation side uh, as opposed to the technical side. Um, but essentially, these are the key things here, right? So security, so we don't have to meet PCI compliance security, but we do have to meet like MPAA compliance, um, CSA, uh, we have to meet things like TPN, it's trusted partner network. So that's a whole set of um, things that we have to align to. It's not really a certification that you pass, it's a way that we handle content. Um, 
And the interesting thing there is that for many of these things like encryption or high value assets, um, we can't store the assets anywhere. We can operate on them as long as they stay in memory. So that's also another you know, interesting pattern that we have to look at. Um, but like Absol discussed, that this notion that the industry has or cloud industry has of like content gravity, um, because it's so expensive to move everything around, it means we have to put the compute where the storage is. Um, and in the processing affinity, we have to put clusters of processing close to each other to optimize that SLA. Um, and then similar for horizontal scale, when you're delivering 4.5 petabytes, there's no steady state, right? So at any point in time, we could get an order for distribution to any country in the world for X amount of titles, assets, branding materials, et cetera, and it all has to be automated. Um, and then finally, obviously, right, this all plays into having to do highly distributed systems and services. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Ebs. Okay. Hi, guys. So how does all this work, right? Now, I'll get into the technical details. Um, the key part is scheduling. Um, and usually when people think of scheduling, they think of resource scheduling. Um, but in our context, it's, it goes much beyond resource scheduling, as I show you here, like CPU, GPU, whether I'm using Spark, ML, Docker, raw exec. Um, obviously, these are constructs that are available in Nomad, and that's what we use at the core to do most of the scheduling. Um, but those are just your high levels. And then to, to take it one step further, we also look at content isolation, uh, process and content gravity, and then the access to and from the content itself. Um, so what does content isolation mean? Um, when we talk about content isolation, we basically say your content is essentially housed in one place, and your access to and from it is very controlled. So in the place where your content lives, you have no processes, right? If you have a process, then you have a vulnerability, you have a potential of someone actually directly manipulating the content. So when we say content isolation, our content actually lives in a completely separate isolation zone. And you can think of that as a data center, a cloud provider, an AWS account, a GCP account, however you want to look at it. Um, but the idea being it is separate. Um, then when we get to uh, process and content gravity, that plays a role with the isolation in that anything that wants to process content now lives in a different isolation zone. So content lives here, but you're processing it here. And the reason for that is we have controlled access between the two to say, if you need to turn on content, whether it's machine learning, whether it's transcoding, I want to generate a subtitle, whatever it is you're doing, you must perform that work in this isolation zone. Um, so that way we have control and we know at all times who's touching what content and what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Um, and to that note, depending on what the process that's being performed, we may move the process to the content, meaning we'll schedule a nomad job to where the content lives, or we may decide that it's better to just pull the content down, like a, a byte range read straight from S3 where we'll do 10 parallel pulls and then have 30 or 40 jobs just work at them in parallel. Um, but depending on what the workflow is, we'll kind of balance out and it'll play into the scheduling as to the size, the transit time, um, and then where the data itself lives. And then finally, you have your access, which is we have services that obviously the customers need to uh, interface with, so they're going to be available on the internet. Um, so a clean line between the two to say these are customer-facing services. These interface with these back-end services that may talk to content, but they don't have direct access. Once again, another layer of security on top of it. Um, egress and ingress. So here's where we did uh, a little bit of a, our own development and coding. Um, how many of you have used Fabia before? All right. Um, so we kind of took Fabia. This was prior to Envoy being popular, prior to Nomad 9. Um, so we kind of took that, and then we kind of extended it to another level to say we're going to add authentication, authorization, and then the exposure of your service on the internet as well. So we overloaded it um, so that in a single Nomad job now, we can basically say this service needs this load balancing. It requires authentication. Here's the URL that we're going to expose on the internet to the point where we can say if you're on the internet, you're forced to go through authentication. So we kind of took Fabio, called it Fabia, A for the auth, 
Um, coincidentally, it means the same thing. One's in Latin and I think one's a different language, but it still means bean. <laughs> Fun fact. Um, so that's, that's, where, that's how we handle um, authentication and authorization between services. Um, you'll see like the sidecar pattern being used a lot where per service you'll have Envoy or Fabio or Fabio attached to each service, um, but we chose to do it at a node level. So we only have one proxy for a given node. Um, and the reason for that is then we have a single point of control where we can say, push a policy down and then everybody has to adhere to the policy rather than implicitly trusting the developer to say, yes, everything is in place and I trust that. Um, and then the final piece is automatic configurations. So the extension to this egress and ingress portion, um, we automatically, at a platform level, take care of the logging, the metrics, monitoring, and secrets. So by default, when we onboard a project, we do some bootstrapping, a bit of code here, a bit of code there, um, and your project gets bootstrapped, but then for SSL, for logging, um, for things like that, once again, we allow the developer to de declare all of that in a single Nomad job, um, and that way, even for us as platform operations, we can go to a single place and we're not running around trying to figure out, oh, where do I get this config, where do I get that config? Um, so all of this, like I said, um, is all from the Nomad job. Nothing is external. The CI portion obviously is external, but when it comes time to deployment and actually actionable things during deployment, they all come from the Nomad job. Um, so this is like a sample. We use Replicator um, to do some of the auto-scaling. We use Fabia as the proxy. Um, and then we have some internal tools that we kind of worked around both of these tools to make work. Um, so now I'll get into like what the actual infrastructure looks like. Um, where do we use scaling? Where do services live? Where do they not live? Why does Nomad work for us so well? Um, so going to this slide, um, this kind of just shows you the breadth of a single environment, if you may. Um, so Nomad kind of sits in, sits in the middle where that's where the masters are, that's where everything's controlled from, and then we have all of these isolation zones that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I'll get into the details of what each isolation zone does shortly here. Um, but each one has an intent and a purpose, um, and then based on that is how work is executed and scheduled. Um, so let's start with uh, the core one. Uh, which is sort of like a shared environment where your masters live, vault lives, um, where operations does all of their management, right? Your Git hooks, your CI, CD, whatever the case may be. Um, that lives in one account. It could be, once again, an AWS account. It could be an on-prem facility. In our case, it's an AWS account. But it's one isolated account, and that's all it does. It's just meant for operations. Um, so any other service, like if we wanted to, in the future, add, um, I don't know, some more monitoring of some sort, it would probably end up in the, in the shared account. Um, and then we get to the internet-facing accounts. So the second portion of the scheduling is the services that need access to the internet or client-facing services, they automatically get scheduled to this environment. Um, you'll see here that all of them have these multiple circles. The hard circles are basically our, our core nomad workers in the middle. And then, as I mentioned earlier, each service is surrounded by a proxy, and Fabia, which handles your authentication, your uh, load balancing via console, um, authorization, et cetera. Next, we move on to the input and output network. So we have dedicated unilateral rules for content distributors and content providers. So let's say we get content from Fox. We have explicit rules allowing us to say they can push or we can pull or vice versa, right? Um, so we have one area or isolation zone that's explicitly dedicated for that and it's only for that. Once again, going back to the content security, we want to isolate what our core catalog is versus what the content we receive and we deliver. Um, so that happens here, so it lands here, and then at some point after certain events take place, it will actually get churned in the real account, um, which is the content account. So after the content gets validated, it's all good and dandy, all the metadata is available, um, we go ahead and actually register that piece of content into the content account where that's all that's happening. So as you can see, that account only manages like, okay, I wanna move from bucket to bucket, or 
I want to change my chunk size because my process requires that if I do this chunk size, I'll get better performance. Um, I want to tier it. I want to go from Glacier automatically um, within a month. If it doesn't get touched, let's put it to Glacier, lifecycle policies. Um, if we need it, then automatically pull it back. So that singular place is solely responsible just to manage content. And that's it. Um, and finally, the true working environment, if you may. So this is where all the core work happens. So anything that touches content lives in this isolation zone. Um, things like transcoding, machine learning, localization, fingerprinting. Um, transcoding and localization are fairly straightforward in terms of fingerprinting and machine learning. Um, those entail how do we identify content, right? If you, a, a good example I can give you is you get Avengers and then you get Avengers Director's Cut. How do you know it's Avengers versus Avengers Director Cut? Short of watching the whole movie. Because it's going to be one scene in the middle that's different. Everything else is going to look the same. Um, so fingerprinting plays a very important role. Otherwise, let's say I got a terabyte file. I'm going to re-accept it all over again because I wasn't able to identify that I already had it. So fingerprinting the content so we can confidently identify and say, yes, this is Avengers Director's Cut or this is the cable version of Avengers and not the theater version. Um, um, and then taking that one step further, um, we have machine learning, which is, as Khan mentioned, like conforming data. You'll get a piece of audio, you'll, ke you'll get a piece of video. It's kind of useless until you can line the data up, right? Otherwise, like you see on Netflix or YouTube sometimes where the video rolls ahead and the audio is kind of lagging behind. Dragon Ball Z, perfect example. Um, it kind of looks like that, right? So without conformance, you get that Dragon Ball Z effect all the time. And without that, the data is useless. So that part plays a very important role to find, oh, we have a gap here. All right, I see there's a gap, so I'm going to have to realign the data. So that's where we use a lot of machine learning and AI algorithms to kind of get the final product out. So in a nutshell, we have services. We have batch jobs. We have micro, uh, sorry, ML um, processes and workflows. Um, so we have a really interesting flow um, and mix of services across the board. And so the challenge is very interesting. Um, me and him talk, but the work gets performed by these wonderful gentlemen here. If they can stand up, please. Right here, up in the front. And the other one hiding underneath the hat. <laughs> um, I think we have a bit more time, um, so feel free to ask questions if you have any. Um, I have one. So, do you, um, it's an awful lot of data to put over the wire. Yes. Do you, how do you do that? How do you reserve that amount? Do you, do you own the wires that go between your locations? What do you do? Good question. Uh, it's a mix of both. So if you look at uh, our traditional model, we owned we owned lines. Like we had private networks going across the world. Um, but now with cloud, um, it's a lot easier, right? We can convince a studio or a client to say, hey, why don't you put it in S3? It'll be cheaper for you and it'll be better for us too. Um, on our private lines or do you mean the public internet? On the public internet. But, I mean, at that point we have the same same constraints as at any other application running on the internet, right? Um, but in cases where we do have, like, we do have dedicated lines for certain customers. If it's a high volume customer, we will have those. It really depends on what the volume is. Traditionally, it's been we have private lines and we have, like, the, uh, like I showed you earlier here, uh, where there's, that's what that particular isolation zone is dedicated for is to handle that level of um, throughput. So we have like dark fiber, Spera, um, HTS, Resilio, different protocols. I mean, obviously the hardware to back it up as well. Um, but in all honesty, like he said, object store, whether it's Amazon or GCP or whatever, it really makes a difference because it really allows us to parallelize a lot of it. Yeah, we, we use... Um so, so we use things like Aspera. We use UDP acceleration quite a lot too. 
And then depending on where we're deployed, whatever cloud provider that is, we'll use their things like WAF, God, Duty, et cetera. Um, for lots of the things like if it's Aspera or Signiant or other products, we'll consume, we'll consume their SaaS service. So basically we are giving them limited time like STS credentials to access our content. And it basically becomes a contract with that vendor, right? Um, we do have an internal ring network, if you will, within LA. So you can think of like most of the studios in LA, they're funneling content back and forth amongst each other. So we have dark fiber that runs there as well. That's our BDN or our broadcast delivery, deluxe delivery network. So we have these different avenues available to us. But if you're thinking about like high value content, most of that will never go over the wire anyway. So if it's mastering, it'll be someone coming into a secure facility with biometrics and literally hand carrying the drive with the master for Avengers to like say have color conformance done on it. And the, the key here is we want to minimize the movement of the data just on sheer size, right? The, if we can land it where it's supposed to be right, in the, right from the get-go, then it makes life a lot easier. Um, yeah, if we can do like a S3 bucket to bucket copy within region with KMS, then we're done, right? It's a backend operation and we don't have to touch it and it doesn't egress over public internet because that factors into cost when you're moving that volume of content as well. Yes, exactly. There is, but it's, it's a lot less. <laughs> So you, you do, a mezzanine file is by definition compressed, but it's compressed at not 200 to 300 megabits per second, but around 30 to 50 megabits. And all of the derivatives, if you think of like a 4K file that's on Netflix, that's probably like way under 20 megabits, depending on what you're playing it back on. Um, like some platforms like PS4 has higher quality for these kinds of things. So it varies, but it's always a lower quality derivative. So those files, we ne we're never moving those like 800 gigabyte files around. Yeah. Um, the one thing we didn't get into is things like dailies and pre-production. That's, that's yeah. another problem we have. Um, when a movie gets shot and those dailies start coming in and then the director and editors want to do what's called rough cuts against that. In other words, start to conform the stuff as it comes off set. That's usually a petabyte per production. And it's about 400 terabytes that move back and forth between houses that basically go, I want to work on this VFX thing. I'm going to composite this, you know, Groot in the scene or whatever it might be, work on the content and then ship it back to you. So that's such a huge amount of content that that's still on-prem. It's like not even feasible to move that to cloud infrastructure right now. There's a big deviation between what comes off the camera to what we see at home. Let's put it to you that way, right? Yeah. Because off the camera to home, like just next time you go on Netflix, hit that star button, it'll tell you the megabits per second. What is it, seven, eight, nine, ten at the most? Compared to the numbers he just mentioned, it's like a drop in the bucket. Like it really doesn't. So to your point, it's like if it's that important, We'll have a guy drive it in, and he's tracked all the way end to end. Um, but for, for the stuff that normal consumers would see, it usually will go over the wire, but it, it, it's chopped to like the 10th or the 15th of the total. Any other questions? What does Ja Rule think? What does Ja Rule think? <laughs> Where's Ja Ja when you need him? <laughs> ja Rule would love this platform. <laughs> For those in the know, no. Dave Chappelle, uh, quick. Uh, so I think we're good, unless anybody else has questions. I don't know. So. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.